right, everyone, good evening and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Victoria Williams. I'm a program officer at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Welcome to tonight's program called The New Rules of War. It's a pleasure to welcome Sean McFate to the council. His new book, The New Rules of War, Victory in the Age of Durable Disorder, will be available for sale and signing after the program, just right over there. Uh, please note that we are on the record and that we are live streaming this event. We always welcome your social media engagement, but please silence your phones. Note that the council is an independent and nonpartisan platform and views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. This program is part of the Lester Crown Center on U.S. Foreign Policy. A generous gift from the Crown family supports all of the center's efforts and development of digital resources to make the Council's foreign policy content more accessible and across all platforms. We want to thank all of our members that are in attendance today. Your support is critical to our work. And if you are not yet a member, we just encourage you to join us. And there's a wide range of levels for you to choose from. Tonight's uh, conversation will be followed by audience Q&A. And we will be taking questions from in the room and from online. You can submit your questions online by just opening up your browser, typing in chi.cnf.io. And we'll be taking those questions from there. But now I'd like to introduce our distinguished speaker, Sean McFate. He's a professor of strategy at the National Defense University, as well as Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Additionally, he's an advisor to Oxford University Center for Technology and Global Affairs. Sean began his career as a paratrooper in the US Army's 82nd Airborne Division and then worked for a major private military corporation where he ran operations there. Sean is also the author, author of several books and speaks pre frequently on military and security matters. I will return to moderate audience Q&A, but please join me in welcoming Sean McFate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you for coming out and being stalwart in this snowy weather. I am from Washington, where a snowflake shuts down the government. Uh, they don't know they don't have snowplows there. Uh, so thank you very much. I I want to talk tonight about war and warfare and how it's changing, how we're not prepared for it, and what we need to do to become prepared for it. It's not a topic we're used to thinking about because we are at least at the moment the world's superpower whose military is unchallenged, yet we find challenges everywhere. So I wrote this book as some background because I was angry. I was angry because I had lost friends in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some of you may have as well. Uh, as a taxpayer, I was angry that we were, seems that we were flushing trillions of dollars down the toilet in places that didn't seem to want our, our assistance much. And I was angry that our national image was being tarnished by low-level foes. All the while, we were achieving very little on the ground. And this made me frustrated. The problem is this, is that we have the best military. We have the best troops, the best training, the best equipment, the best technology, the most money. We spend more money on the Department of Defense than the next eight biggest countries combined. Combined. So the question is, what's the problem? Right? What's the problem? And this is not just a US problem, but the West. Has the West forgotten to win how to win wars? The last time the West decisively won a war was in 1945 and the world ran on vacuum tubes. And by the West, I'm using that word very loosely. I'm thinking sort of NATO-type forces. The implications of this are terrifying. If the West no longer knows how to win wars, if the US no longer knows how to win wars, what does the future hold for everybody, for the world? So that's what I set out to do. This was the puzzle of the book. Um, the answer, just quickly, is that war has moved on. And we have to move on to as well. Our enemies, everybody, it seems, except for us, grasp this. Everybody grasps, grasps this. And then we wonder why we struggle, because we're, we're playing under an older set of rules for war. Here's an example, torn from the headlines of today, Venezuela. Right? Venezuela, once the richest country in Latin America, is pulling a full tilt Somalia. It's a human tragedy. 
as you all know, we have two presidents there, right? One is backed by the people and backed by the United States and much of Latin America and much of the EU pro-democracies. And the other, Maduro, is backed by the military and by China, Russia, and Turkey, autocracies. Seems like we have an ideological war in our midst, but that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight with Venezuela. Did you know about two weeks ago, Russian mercenaries secretly appeared in Venezuela? And these are not just any Russian mercenaries. And I say Russian mercenaries. This is a group called the Wagner Group. It's a company. It works for the GRU, which is their military intelligence. And they're mercenaries. We don't know that the top level leadership is all Russian, but the ranks are, they're mercenaries. They're from all over the place. They're from all over the place. And they, just to give you an idea of what they are, these are not lone riflemen in the Congo, the Klishnikovs, they're not the, the villains of Hollywood. They are highly effective killers. A year ago, they almost took out some of our best troops in Syria. 500 Wagner Group mercenaries attacked an outpost in eastern Syria. That was, and that these weren't just normal soldiers, this was Delta Force, Rangers, Green Berets, Marines, and there's a Kurdish militia. And when the 500 mercenaries attacked, they attacked with tanks, artillery, armored personnel carriers. And our troops, our, our best troops called in our best air support, B-52s, F-15s, AC-130 gunships, Apache helicopters, drone strike ships. And it still took our best troops with our best aviation four hours to beat back 500 mercenaries. Four hours. What happens when they have to face 5,000 mercenaries? Even an undefeated military can lose. This, that's who's in Venezuela right now. And what they're doing, we do not know. Now, I know there are rumors of them going into, you've been in Syria and Ukraine, uh, kneecapping uh, militia who, who were supposed to be pro-Russian militia, and they were starting to waver. They kill the leaders to get them back in line, to, to apply discipline. So perhaps that's what they're doing with, with the Venezuelan army, sort of striking fear into them. But this is an example of the new rules of war, mercenaries. You don't use your own forces. You use others. And we'll talk about that. War has moved on. We have to move on with it. So if I was to ask you what the biggest threats facing us today are, we could all spend the whole evening listing out the panoply of horrors. Some think it's China. Others think it's Russia. We can make a case for Iran. We can, we can keep on going. Drug lords and uh, terrorists, you name it. All right? uh, genocide, climate change. The biggest threat, though, even though these are bad, leaving climate change out of it, the biggest threat is not actors. The biggest threat is systemic. It's something I call durable disorder. And what durable disorder is, it's the vacuum as states retreat, as the Westphalian system of states is retreating around the world. What's left in their wake is durable disorder. It's not anarchy. It's not the sky is falling, we have to invest in more sky. Um, but it is more organic and wild than the world that we were taught in sixth grade social studies. Um, of the 190 some states in the world, about only about 25 or 30 are considered strong. This is an order that can contain problems but not solve them. It is not anarchy, but it's marked by persistent, never-ending conflict and entropy, right? Forever wars is what we call them colloquially. And it is a systemic threat. It's systemic that gives rise to these other threats. It is also not new. It is not new. So we all remember somewhere, I hope, reading Machiavelli, The Prince. This is the world he was talking about. Northern Italy during the Renaissance and early, well, early Renaissance and Middle Ages was durable disorder. 
full of mercenaries and full of anybody who had enough money could buy armies and wage war for any reason they want, no matter how petty. Uh, war was everywhere all the time. Even popes had armies that they hired. And this is what he was lamenting in his books, The Prince, Discourses on Livy, The Art of War, etc. He saw it turn uh, populations into, you know, into sheep, basically. Um, and this is the Italian wars, which looks like sort of Afghanistan or the Middle East today. The truth is, is that world history is more, is really disorder. It's not, we always think of like order, the world order being about states and their national militaries. That's anomalous. And it's only about two or three or 100, 400 years old. Most of history looks like this. And we're just going back to the status quo ante of what history was before which may also be a fiction of our imagination in terms of how ordered the world really was. So here are some signs of durable disorder today. Half of all peace treaties fail within five years. The majority of the world's states are facing some form of conflict. Conflicts have doubled since World War II. No matter what data set you look at, it, you know, there's, we can question the data sets, but violence has been an upswing. It's not the Fukuyama eternal democracy moment that was predicted for the end of history. Um, you know, we are seeing forever wars. When I talk to young people, that's what they think that wars become permanently. It doesn't have to be that way. This book is about that. So this is all, and we're seeing the return of mercenaries as well, who like to create wars or elongate wars for profit. This is durable disorder. The rules-based order is retreating. Now, those who grasp this, who grasp durable disorder, will prevail, because they can exploit it, like China, Russia, terrorists, others, all the, the panoply we discussed. Those who do not will become exploited. And this is what concerns me about what we talk about today. Much of US foreign policy is Humpty Dumpty. We're trying to recreate the international liberal order as we imagine it. Whether that is real or fiction is one of some debate. But US national security strategy, fundamentally, from administration to administration, tries to do just this, relive and bring back the glory days. But it's too late. We've been strategically adrift since the Cold War. And in that time, durable disorder has set back in again. So we have a new kind of world order, durable disorder, and it begets a new type of warfare, a new type of warfare. And that's what we are not grasping. So the national defense strategy of last year, 2018, the, the, the Pentagon issued new guidance as to what we need to think about our future and how to defend ourselves. They shifted away from counterinsurgency and counterterrorism to bigger near peer threats like Russia and China specifically. But why does everybody who thinks that there's going to be a war with Russia and China, why does everybody think it's, it's going to be a conventional war? Conventional war is, like world war, let's think of World War I, World War II. It's the warfare of Westphalia. It's the warfare of Clausewitz. It's the warfare of big industrialized national militaries hitting each other just like you know, the Battle of the Bulge or perhaps the Folda Gap in World War III, if we ever had, had a World War III in the 80s, for example. But that doesn't exist anymore. Nobody fights this way. Nobody fights this way at all. Data shows clearly that there's nothing more unconventional today than a conventional war. One question is, are we already at war with Russia and China, and Russia and China are trying to deliberately keeping, keep us from understanding that as part of the strategy. So what does war look like under durable disorder? Well, war is getting sneakier. It's not conventional. It's not going to be tank on tank, aircraft carrier on aircraft carrier. Don't expect the Battle of Midway with F-35s. It's going underground. It's going into the shadows. So for example, Look at what Russia did to take the Crimea. They had the military strength to blitzkrieg through eastern Ukraine and seize the Crimea. But they chose not to do that. They 
used covert means instead. They used Spetsnaz, which is their special forces, mercenaries, proxy militia, little green men, and a lot of information warfare. And it's, it's a brilliant strategy because we live in, in a global information era where plausible deniability is now more powerful than firepower. How can the world rally a defense for Crimea when the basic conflicts, when the basic facts around the conflict are in question? By the time the, the West and others were bickering about what's really going on in Ukraine, Crimea was already fait accompli. And that's how they took Crimea. How about the South China Sea? In the old rules of war, we think of there's war or peace. We think of war and peace like pregnancy. You either are or you're not, right? And that peace, well, war is the failure of peace. But in truth, there's no such thing as war or peace. There's only war and peace in the new rules of war. And China exploits this for victory. What they do in the South China Sea is they, go, they do things that go right up to the brink of war, and they stop. When we're about to sort of freak out, they stop. But they keep everything they capture. And that's how they're winning the South China Sea, one island and one ally at the time. And it has nothing to do with aircraft groups or anything like that. They're, they're being strategically cunning. They're being sneaky about it. Meanwhile, we're preparing for, again, midway with better technology. Or how about this? Mercenaries are everywhere nowadays. 25 years ago, this would have been anathema to think about. But we have seen mercenary activity and organized ones like the Wagner Group in Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Nigeria, Somalia, the Congo, now Venezuela. Mercenaries are returning, but always in the shadow. These, this is a picture of ex-SEALs and ex-Special Forces, Americans, our elite soldiers, who are mercenaries now in Yemen acting as kill squads for a Middle Eastern monarchy. Mercenaries are a big thing now, and it's deliberately kept under radar so that people don't see it. It's sneaky. So in the future, victory will go to the cunning and not the strong. But this is not our strategic culture. We're still thinking about kinetic force as being more important than cunning. Um, that is part of our problem. So durable disorder is the new environment for war. Our problem is, is that we are not set up to fight in this environment. Our, our habits, our bureaucracy, our force structure, our training, our strategic culture is all still essentially World War II. It's conventional war. And then we wonder why we struggle in Afghanistan, Iraq, everywhere in the world. The world has moved on with its warfare. We have not, despite our overwhelming power. This is what I call strategic atrophy. And this doesn't, this doesn't amongst the top ranks of our national security establishment, I'm talking about you know, top generals, but politicians, policymakers, that whole strata, we have, frankly, a low strategic IQ. And that's why we're struggling. We have the best military, the best troops, the best resources, the best of everything. What we are not doing is we're not applying it correctly to achieve our national interests. We have strategic atrophy. We're still mired in the past. So for example, here is war as we imagine it. Maybe not you, but if you go to a think tank event in Washington or something like that, this is what it looks like. Robots, right? Forget D-Day, when, that, when that, you know, that landing craft hits the beach, robots are gonna come out and gonna take, but that's not how war is fought. It's not gonna be robots. Um, or they have some sort of thing that looks like this. Now you think you're looking at a video game called a Call of Duty, it's not. This is what DARPA is trying to develop. Uh, but these are all tactical solutions but war, as we know, is not won tactically. It's won at the strategic level. We learned that in Vietnam, right? You can win every tactical engagement, every battle, but yet lose the war. But here we're investing, we're doubling down on conventional weapons with better technology. It's the very definition of insanity. 
For 70 years, one thing has been very clear in warfare is that technology does not matter. Luddites, technological primitives, have routinely beaten advanced technological militaries. France in Algeria or into China, British in Palestine and Cyprus, the Soviets in Afghanistan, the US in Vietnam, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the UN as well, around the world. So why are we investing more in conventional war and, te and technology? It seems to be idiotic. This is one of the chief culprits, the F-35 fighter jet. This plane has cost American taxpayers $1.5 trillion. Trillion.